All right, hi everybody out there. Thanks for joining us. Uh, this is John McDougall. Apparently I don't know my name tonight. Uh, this is John McDougall. I am the event coordinator at Murder by the Book here in Houston. And while we give everybody a few minutes to come find us from, from Facebook and YouTube, I'll do a couple of real quick housekeeping things. So thanks for joining us tonight. We're super excited about tonight's event and we will get started in just a minute. But we wanted to let everybody know, just in case you hadn't seen it in the newsletter or on Twitter, Facebook, all of those places, that we are open for browsing again. So if you have not been in the store in a while and you want to come visit, uh, please do. Our store hours at the moment are 10 to 6, Monday through Saturday. Um, of course, masks are required to come in the store, and uh, we're limiting it to six people in the store at a time, but that hasn't really been an issue. So if you come up and you just see the parking lot full, maybe just poke your head in and ask where we're at capacity-wise, and we will get you set up. Um, if you are tuning into one of our virtual events for the first time. Welcome. Um, we did over 130 of them last year with over 200 authors. So we've got a really great roster of things to check out. Uh, you can check those out either on the store's Facebook channel or um, our Facebook page or our YouTube channel. We've got a lot of great stuff coming up uh, tomorrow. McKenna, the store owner, will be chatting with Michael Carita and Sandra Brown at one o'clock. On uh, Monday at five, we're doing a, an event with uh, the publishers Agora and Polis. We've got a nice panel set up there. Um, we'll be chatting with Walter Mosley on February 18th. So lots of great stuff coming up and you can check out murderbooks.com to um, see what else we've got going on at the store. Also wanted to mention before we get into it tonight, uh, John Hart's new book, The Unwilling, has just come out on Tuesday and we do have uh, signed book plates to go with our copies. So anybody who uh, orders a copy of the book or any of John's books from us, we have got uh, signed book plates. So we're going to get started. Uh, we're so excited tonight to have John Hart with us. He's been a, a huge uh, staff favorite at the store for years. We were just talking before we got started about how um, we were bummed that we were not able to see him this year. Uh, the event was originally scheduled. We had him on the calendar for June of 2020, but with COVID hitting, um, they had postponed the publication of the book. So we've actually had this date on hold for probably about eight months now. So we're excited that it's finally February and we're able to do our virtual event with him. Um, so he's going to be joined tonight by AJ Finn, who was graciously uh, offered to moderate for us. So I'm going to get them introduced and bring them out. We are going to start with John Hart. How are you tonight, John? Hey, how are you, John? I, I have no complaints other than the obvious of COVID. Delighted yep. to be with you guys. And, and thank you to uh, Dan, AJ, Finn, and Mallory for being here with us. Yeah, so if you guys are tuning in and you are not familiar with John Hart, he is the author of the New York Times bestsellers, The King of Lies, Down River, The Last Child, Iron House, Redemption Road, and The Hush. The only author in history to win the Edgar Award for Best Novel consecutively, John has also won the Barry Award, the Southern Independent Booksellers Award for Fiction, the Ian Fleming Steel Dagger Award, and the North Carolina Award for Literature. His novels have been translated into 30 languages and can be found in more than 70 countries. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, The Unwilling is his newest release, and we have signed book plates for that, and we're super excited to hear him chat about that. And as I said, we are super also excited tonight to be joined by AJ Finn. How are you tonight? Oh, uh, cold, cold. cold. <laughs> I did want to say to John beforehand that I apologize for my my uh, scene setting here. Every inch of our home in New York is under renovation. It looks like Guantanamo outside. This is the best I could do. So I apologize. John is poised before this lovely molding, and I am I'm like Walking Dead here. But we're we're very happy, very happy to be talking to John Hart. Yeah, thank so, you for that, AJ. I really appreciate you coming in tonight. Seriously, it's good of you. Absolutely my privilege. So, AJ, what is cold for you? You said cold. What, how, what's the temperature? <sighs> Negative 40. No, it's it's probably <laughs> not that bad. It's probably <laughs> like 29. But, yeah, I've, I've, I've spent a lot of my life in England as well where it never gets particularly chilly. So this is, uh, yeah, it's a little nippy. If it makes you feel better, it's 50 here, and I've been running around all day complaining about how cold it is. So <laughs> That's pathetic. Yep. That's yeah, <laughs> it really is. <laughs> so and so before we get into it, if you guys are all unfamiliar with AJ Finn, as he mentioned, uh, he lived in England for many years we were, before returning to his native New York. His debut novel, The Woman in the Window, which was also a huge part of the book staff favorite, uh, has been published in more than 40 languages and sold millions of copies worldwide. 
So if you guys have not tuned into one of our virtual events before, I'm going to let these two guys chat and get into it. If you have questions for AJ or John, please post those in the comments either on Facebook or YouTube. I will be monitoring those and I'll pop back in a little bit later and we'll leave some time for Q&A. So gentlemen, I'm going to leave you to it and I will see you in a little bit. All right. Thank you, John. Thank you very much. So Mr. John Hart, I'm going to upstage you only briefly here. I do have a partner in crime with me tonight. I, I mentioned her because <laughs> she, she's going to be hanging around this room. She snores. That's it. So if you hear anything in the background, I mean, I've heard worse, but. Ugh. Hey, so, so AJ, I, I have four dogs. One of them is the two. <laughs> <kind> of <laughs> of okay, wait, you just upstaged me. That was pretty no, well, I'm, not, I'm not trying to, <laughs> but I, but I have four dogs. Now, granted, I live on 140 acres, so it's easier, but. One of them is a 180-pound Mastiff, um, you know, same sweet temperament. But when this dog snores, he, the house vibrates. <laughs> so I get it. Is that is that a Neapolitan Mastiff? No, no, it's English Mastiff. Oh, okay. They're they're. I mean, they're epic. They're oh, epic. they're epic. And the of course, we we don't need to to uh, get into this, but you probably know. I mean, the history of these dogs is absolutely unbelievable. Yeah. You know, going all the way back to Roman war dogs and you know, uh, bred for gentler times, but still pretty fierce in their core. I mean, it's an amazing, it's an amazing animal. Uh, my wife wanted it because I'm on the road so much on tour pre COVID. Yes. Yeah. So if I leave for six weeks, she really likes having another 200 pound animal in the bed. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm not sure how I feel about that. But we're working it out. John, I quite like to think that you looked at this, at this pooch as a puppy and thought a noble warrior's heart. You know, I can identify well, with it. It was the sweater. It was the sweater. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I looked at the French bulldog and thought, oh, she sleeps. And we, Hey, we love the Frenchies, man. We love oh, the Frenchies. Useless but adorable. So I've got quite a few questions for you. I'll start with a, a pretty small one. You were telling me earlier that you were born in North Carolina, is, and it was Durham, right? That is absolutely correct, yes. Okay. And then you went down to Davidson College, just outside Charlotte. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I left Durham when I was seven. I was raised in a little town called Salisbury, which is kind of equidistant between Durham and Davidson. So it was not a big trip. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty close. Fair enough. The reason I mention this is that I spent my four years of high school in Charlotte, right near Davidson. Oh, and then nice? I went up to Durham, where I did my undergraduate degree at Duke. So I think we were like in a parent trap situation. Well, well, let, let, let's take it a little deeper. Um, I don't know when you were at Duke and I, I can promise you this is before you were there, but in the sixties, uh -huh. my grandfather was the president of Duke and uh, the president's house now is actually called the Hart house. It was my grandparents' house. Um, you may have studied in the Daryl Hart reading room. I was, a, yeah, I was just about to say that. Yes. Yeah. So that was my grandfather. <laughs> Wow, get out of my life, John Harter. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I mean, I'm you, you got there first. <laughs> so these are strange times, as you're aware. Having only published one book, I am, you know. Totally what a book. What a book. Come on, oh, man. It, well, it was well timed. I'll on. say that. I did not have to, you know, I didn't have to do this. How are you feeling about this new style of touring and promotion? Uh, I'll be honest with you. It's I'm um, I'm conflicted. You know, I um, mm -hmm. I love the readers. Mm -hmm. I love the travel. Uh, normally, I will do six weeks on the road, thirty-five to forty cities, usually coast to coast and back. And after you know this as well as I, I mean, I mean for all the reasons, writing is a super lonely business. Yes, and so. Um, I'm sorry, I've got horrible allergies um, at the moment. I'm not sure why, but going on tour for me was always like the chance to put all the loneliness behind and connect with people and, and really remember why this matters so much. I mean, because it's about the readers and the readers reaction to what we do. I mean, it's about touching people. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, that was a hard thing to give up mm -hmm. when we, you know, we were supposed to come out in June of last year the idea was we postponed it until now and all this COVID business would be over and I could go back on the road. Of course, <laughs> you know, that, that, that was a fool's paradise. <laughs> that never happened. Um, 
but look, this, this it's it's the marvel of technology. I mean, bandwidth five years ago or less would have never allowed this. We'd have all been living in darkness. Mm -hmm. You, me, none of us would have been able to reach out to booksellers and readers. So, I mean, I'm thankful for what I have, like, as I am in all things in life, you know, family, opportunity, um, you know, the breath in my lungs. Um, it, it's a change, right? I mean, it's a change. And I hope it's not the new normal. I mean, I, I love what John and McKenna are doing with this bookstore and others, but I, I would really like to get back on the road for my next book. I guess that's the short answer. At what point prior to the book's originally scheduled publication in June, I think you mentioned of last year, at what yep. point did your publisher say, you know what, we're going to pull the plug on this and reschedule? And how did you feel about that? It was actually my idea. Um, oh. So I, I'm a pretty... You know, I'm, I'm not the smartest guy in the world, but I'm pretty widely read. I, I pay attention to what's going on. And I saw this COVID thing coming a long time uh, before January, February. I mean, I, I was really kind of dialed into it. And um, I think it was February, early March when things were starting to get very real that I finally decided it was time to talk to the publishers. And um, it took a little bit of time. They agreed that it was wise. Look, they, they, they're invested in me. I'm invested in them. This is an important you know how it is, man. It's a relationship. I mean, you yes. know, if I do well, they do well. If if they do well, I do well. It, it's one of those things. So publishers were really torn apart in you know March and April of last year because a lot of writers were struggling with the same thing. And so the question becomes, who do we push? Who do we keep? Um, mm -hmm. We don't know what's happening. We don't know what's coming. I mean, it, everything was in play. Everything was in play. But I'm the one that actually uh, brokered that conversation. Uh, I'm not sad that I did it because I know for a fact that books that came out in March, April, May, and June, they kind of dropped into a black hole. Yes. It, yeah, they did. It, it didn't matter how good they were. I mean, it could be the most brilliant writers in the world. And, and you know, you know, some of them, I know some of them and, and the, you know, they, they just got hammered. Yep. Um, so I don't regret doing it. Um, what troubles me is this idea we all had that we're just going to dip down and come out and then we're done. And here we are, you know, 10, 11 months later, and we're not done. I mean, it's still ongoing. It, it is what it is. So um, the heroes are John and McKenna and these booksellers that are figuring out how to do it. But it's really, truly frustrating for me because I love talking to readers. Yes. And when I go too long without it, honestly, man, I, it, I forget why I'm doing this in the first place. You know, it's a... Uh, uh, you know, the checks come, the words come. That's great. But I'm doing it to entertain people. Mm -hmm. Anyway, it, it's it's complicated times. For what it's worth, I used to work in publishing. I spent a decade in the industry. And having spoken to quite a few individuals on both sides of the pond about COVID book selling, they've collectively pointed out, and John and McKenna might contradict me here, in which case I'll ignore them, but they pointed out that... During this time, no publisher has launched a major breakout fiction title, debut or otherwise. Very few big brand authors are seeing any sort of uptick in their sales. Mm -hmm. Last year, I gather, book sales were up markedly over 2019, which is terrific. I suspect that a lot of that was down to books about, for, or against Trump. And I don't recall any particular fiction successes. So my completely useless and unsolicited take is that you were absolutely right to suggest not only a, a deferment, but a significant deferment. Look, I don't pretend to understand uh, the decisions our publishers have had to make. It's, um, you know, it's tough for everybody out there trying to, you know, we're all casting bones and reading tea leaves, right? I mean, no, none of us know what's coming. I think that the up, there has been an uptick in uh, book sales. I suspect that that is because of educational titles, because kids are homeschooled more and schools are closed. And totally right. Yes, yeah. yeah, so I, I read these. I read these articles about you know the big the big four or five. They're up ten percent, twelve percent. I think it's it's educational books and it's like seriously established brand name authors. So if you're your average consumer out there in, in the heartland and you're bored and you can't go to the basketball games or the movie theater or your favorite watering hole, you go to Amazon, which, you know, I mean, Amazon serves a function, right? But, but yeah. 
I mean, I hurt, I hurt for the independents because they, they matter so much in terms of helping young guys uh, find their way. Um, the people that go to Amazon, you know, they, they've got, you know, we can only hold so much. They've got maybe 30 names in their head. Oh my God, I need to read, you know, Stephen King or, you know, whoever, John Grisham. I mean, and John's a buddy of mine. And I'll say that to his face. Um, I think those guys are insulated. I think the educational books are, um, you know, boosting the publishers. I think that it's very difficult when people cannot go into a bookstore, interact with people like John McKenna, um, mm -hmm. you know, booksellers that are passionate about what they do. They can put a book in their hand and say, you really need to read this guy. Mm -hmm. And you, I mean, look, you, you come from publishing. I'm sure you know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, I don't know a better answer. I mean, I don't know what the solution is. You know, all I can do is my part. I, I, you know, I've got a friend that talks about, you know, cavemanning every day. Like I get up every day. How do I put food on the table? How do I protect my people? How do I, you know, seriously, all I can do is I can write the best book I can write. I can't control COVID. I can't control publishing. You know, I, I love my, my booksellers, but I can't keep no. their doors open. So it's, it is what it is. I will say having come in from East Hampton, New York today, and having swung by Bookhampton, the indie bookshop there, that one seldom goes into a bookstore and is greeted frostily or, or greeted not at all. Because, and I, I hope that John McKenna will excuse me for, for observing this, at the lower levels at least, you know, book selling is not, you're not gonna get rich. You, there absolutely is room for, for upward mobility, but it's, it's done for love of the game. And that's one of the many reasons I love talking to booksellers, not necessarily as an author, but just as a, as a, as a reader. Yeah. So. It's not, it's not a corporate decision. I mean, you know, yeah. people will go into publishing for the same reason yep. because they love books and they love the idea of creating dialogue and, and finding voices and doing all these things. And I think booksellers are in it for the same reason. And frankly, you and I are in it for the same reason. I mean, we don't, you don't know what you're going to write in 20 years. I don't know what I'm going to write in 20 years, but we want to have the opportunity to stand up and say something. And so the business matters. Um, my, my great concern about this whole COVID business is that all the things that I love are under threat. I mean, my favorite uh, movie theaters, my favorite bars, restaurants, bookstores, my favorite authors. I mean, yeah. if you're a, if you're a, an unsinkable battleship author, meaning nationally branded. You're damn close, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> but, but if you're that guy, if you're that guy, you know, COVID's great. It's like Jeff Bezos is 40% wealthier now than he was 10 months ago because, you know, it's all, it's all e-commerce now. Um, and that's a whole other story. But um, I think it's really important that we get through this with the things that we love intact on the other side. And that's what I worry about. John, if I may, I'd like to guide you thus. First, I'd, I'd like to talk about your career and how it has been shaped. And then I'd like to get to the specifics of this book. And thank you to John and McKenna for sending me a copy. And thank you to St. Martin's for sending me a copy. And thank you to the Soho House Hotel in Miami for sending me a copy, which had been sent to me by someone. So I have, I'm like... <laughs> you might have more copies than I do. <laughs> <laughs> but, but possibly. Uh, first, I, I know that I tend to speak in block paragraphs, so this will be my final block paragraph. I did want to tell you that in the summer of 2008, I was a graduate student at Oxford. I'd done my master's there years earlier. I was doing a doctorate, but decided about 74% of the way through that my English wasn't good enough. And I was living in this lovely cottage with five housemates. And a friend of mine at Transworld, part of Random House UK, had mentioned to me that the Richard and Judy picks had just been announced and she read them to me. And she mentioned Down River by John Hart. And I thought, he wrote The King of Lies. He wrote that legal thriller that I remember was well reviewed. I didn't read it because, and and this is this is what I don't want other people to do. Don't fall into this trap. I didn't read that because I don't like legal thrillers. They're for my dad. He reads Grisham. That's what, yeah. <laughs> but this publisher at Transworld said, ooh, he's really good looking. 
And I thought, okay, well, I would like to be both good looking and a successful author. So let me, let me read Down River, even though I don't like legal thrillers. And I read it, and this will sound storied, but it is actually accurate. I remember I read it, that and Kate Atkinson's When Will There Be Good News, on my back, on the grass, behind our little cottage, right next to the grass tennis courts and near this, well, it, it was like a, it was like a strand of spit, the river, but I, I, I remember it as a babbling brook. And I couldn't stop. I couldn't stop. As a publisher, you apply that, that epithet really to every book. You can't stop. Unstoppable. Unputdownable. I couldn't stop. And I realized afterwards I couldn't stop because it was not a legal thriller. It was a... It was a novel of suspense, certainly, and as a suspense reader, I'm attuned to that. It was a novel of heart and force. And above all, I would describe that book and, and your every book as soulful. That to me is how John Hart's novels are best described. They are soulful. And when 10 years later, I became a novelist myself, I said to my agent, there are three authors whose careers I would like to emulate. They are in no particular order. No, let's do it alphabetically. Kate Atkinson, who writes detective novels, but also more literary fiction, often historical. Tana French, the Irish-American author who writes these dense, intense, lyrical novels, most of them in a series, and John Hart. And I cited you three in part, to be fair, because I liked your writing schedule. It wasn't every single year, mm -hmm. which I certainly couldn't sustain. I mean, hell, it's been four years or whatever. I'll, <laughs> it's a I'll never write again. <laughs> but but mostly it was because you were writing and you were you were the closest cop you were writing books that shape shifted as 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 I read them and as I watched your publications morph so having said all of that I want to thank you and I I'm I'm not very uh, comfortable looking people in the eye and saying thank you but truly thank you your books have really enriched me I think as a as a reader and to no mean extent as a person they are humane they are loaded with empathy this one in particular so I would like you if you don't mind to just take us through the period before your career and then how it developed. I, I would be personally fascinated to hear this. I hope our listeners will be too. If they're not, I don't, I don't care. Just, just tell me. <laughs> um, okay. So, so let me, let me first of all say, I love your black paragraphs. That was the, uh, <laughs> yeah. That was thank you. No, thank you. Um, and, and let me take you back for a moment to, to 2008 when uh, Down River, which was my second novel, was chosen as a Richard and Judy pick. And for those in the States that don't understand, that's like being an Oprah pick. I mean, it's it's a big deal uh, over in the UK. I, I think it's kind of gone away now, but back in the day, it was a thing, right? It's faded, but back then, oh, man. Oh, yeah. was, it, yeah. was, it was a thing. So... Um, I'll never forget 2008. You may have seen this. There, there's some um, newsprint publication, some pulpy thing. I'm doing this. Some pulpy thing that is it, given away free in all the tube stops and bus stations. I can't remember what it's called. Uh, but, but the publisher did this big buy where I was on the cover, the inside cover, the inside back cover, and then the back. So I was on wow. full page, full color. And it was a million copies a day that were picked up by commuters all over London. 
because of the Richard and Judy thing. Uh -huh. And I, I'll never forget. I'm going to butcher this this accent, but I'm going to do it anyway. Go for it, please. I got a call from my publisher, a lovely woman named Kate, who said, "Congratulations, John! You're now the most ubiquitous piece of litter in all of London." <laughs> Which, I mean, I'm sorry. Uh, I've oh, laughed. Man. Right. It was hilarious. And, and literally, I picture all these things just like wafted along behind the tubes in you know, the train. <laughs> um, so, so anyway, yeah, that that was kind of crazy. That was my second novel. It was heady stuff. Thank you um, for your reaction to it. I mean, I, I've had reactions to books like that. Um, I, I don't know how to respond to your your very lovely commentary on what I wrote, but I, I will tell you sort of what led me into this. Um, I imagine like you, I mean, I know you've been in publishing, you're obviously a very good novelist. Um, you were probably an, an, an exorbitant reader in childhood. Oh, yeah, I mean, just, you know, I mean, it's, show me a um, truly awesome writer that wasn't that kid and, yep. and I, I won't believe you. I mean, it's, it's, um, it's like that important. So super um, big reader, you know, I give my, parents all the credit they read to me and they taught me to love literature and 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 i'm an escapist you know i don't know about you but when i read novels i want to be drawn from my life and whisked away and you know do all these things that great novels do i want to be a part of that so um i read books and books and books and books and books and i, and I always would get to the one book or the other and i would say to myself i can do it better than that you know what I'm saying? Yeah. It's like, I, I love this part of it, but it can be better. And why don't they do this? And why don't they do that? But there is no path to writing novels. There's no path to success in this career. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, you can do the MFA. You can read the books. It's, it's a, I mean, it's, it, it's, it's a swamp. I mean, there are no clear trails. I mean, you, you, you think you know where you're going and next thing you know, you're up to your head in quicksand and you've wasted 10 months of your life. So, uh, I, I did that. Perhaps you did as well. Um, but I wrote my first outline when I was 20. Mm -hmm. And um, I'll, I'll give you, an, I, I, I'm going to paint a word picture here. So I'm 20 years old. And when you're 20, you don't know what's going on. I mean, you think you do, but you really don't. I mean, I look back and I'm like, <laughs> who the hell is that kid, right? No, um, I'm living at the coast of North Carolina and I'm restoring sailboats for a living in the summer after my sophomore year in college. Now, cool. restoring sailboats for a living sounds great, yeah. but that's sexy talk for sanding teak for a minimum wage 10 hours a day. I mean, I'm, I've got a great tan. <laughs> I mean, I'm tan and I'm fit, but you know, I am poor. <laughs> I'm like really poor. Pop that balloon for me. Yeah, sure. Okay. Yeah, fair enough. So, but I would get off the marinas and I would go out to my favorite watering hole and I would sit at the bar and I would outline the great American novel I intended to write. And I, I, it was a stack of cocktail napkins this tall. <laughs> I still have it. And it never got off the cocktail napkin because honestly, no 20 year old should ever write a novel. They don't know enough. They're, they're ignorant. They're stupid. They're way too full of themselves. I was that guy. I suspect you were that guy. Um, and you have to live enough to actually understand what people want to read about and to understand how the complexities of life drive this narrative. I mean, pick a narrative. I mean, a national narrative, a family narrative, a, an individual's narrative. I mean, you, you have to understand what's going on. So, um, but I knew at 20 that I wanted to do it. I took some bad advice about seven years later and ended up in a master's in accounting. Okay, let's just stop for a minute and appreciate this. <laughs> <laughs> writer brain and a master's of accounting program. I mean, I love the guy that told me I should do it, but I would really just, I would, <laughs> yeah. I mean, what were you thinking? <laughs> and why did I listen? <laughs> um, but, but here's the beauty of um, going for this year. I was at university of North Carolina and I, and I decided I was going to get a master's in accounting before I went to law school. Right. And again, I apologize for this. It's just one of those times. Um, so uh, here's the beauty of it. Life is complicated and unexpected, and it rewards you in ways you can envision. So I got into this program with 150 kids that were so that person. I mean, they yeah. got it. They loved it. I mean, 
finance, calculus, whatever. I mean, they they just it, it made sense. I was like, why am I here? I mean, I don't know why I'm here. I mean, thank God it was a pass fail program. Um, but it taught me to do something very important, which is to stop talking about writing a novel. Mm-hmm. And I know you've probably met a thousand people that have thought about writing a novel. Yes. I mean, it's very easy to have it all worked out in your head. It's very different to sit down and write it. So this year was so miserable for me. I would work, 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 try to keep up with these, you know, other brained people. And then at 10 at night until one in the morning, I would write fiction just to have a release. And that book was imminently unpublishable. I mean, I, finished it. I, mean, I was a wildly unpublished author, certainly in the eastern part of the United States. I, gave, um, I was rejected by everyone who saw it. And, and I'm, I'm so proud of the story, but the writing was sophomoric. <laughs> I ended up in law school and I got a year in and I said, you know what? I I really don't think I want to be a lawyer either. Mm -hmm. And magical thinking, right? I mean, magical thinking is important to writers. And the magical thinking that I had was, well, in spite of this failed novel, I'm just going to write another one while I'm in law school Mm -hmm. and sell it for a million bucks. And I don't really have to be a lawyer. I can just be this writer guy. Well, that was, of course, you know, absurd. I mean, I, I didn't know what I was doing. (laughs) <laughs> um, I, some years later, I was in criminal practice back in my hometown in North Carolina. I had married the woman of my dreams. We had a brand new daughter. Um, I'd almost forgotten the passion for writing. I mean, because for me, it's very goal oriented. I wanted to be a writer. You know, sure. I, I just wanted the life. Well, baby lawyers, which is what one is for those first couple of years, yes. deal with idiots and you know, morons that get drunk and wreck their car. They get drunk and start a fight. They're not evil necessarily. Mm -hmm. Two years in, one starts to brush up against the rapists and the murderers and everything else. And um, six weeks after my daughter was born, I was assigned by the court to defend a child molester who had raped his four-year-old stepdaughter. He admitted it to me, wanted to know what I was going to do to fix it. And I was like, you know what? You know, I, I can't represent this guy. And this is a line that all defense attorneys approach and either back away from or step over. I mean, it, it, it's the reality. Like you, you can um, embrace the ideology of advocacy in a, um, you know, controversial setting where he fights and I fight and we find the truth through the battle. But on the ground, it's about this guilty SOB over here that raped his four-year-old stepdaughter. And I was like, you know, I'm not going to take this case. I was court appointed uh, and I went to the judge and she said, tough. And I went to my firm and they said, tough, you know, you're take it. You have a job, do the job. So uh, I decided, you know, maybe this is the chance to try one more uh, grasp at the brass ring of getting published. And I'm actually, this is my hand going for the brass ring. So, um, in secret, I wrote the opening scene to The King of Lies um, without telling my wife because I wanted her buy-in. If I'm going to quit, you know, a career with a stay-at-home wife and a brand new kid, I mean, she has to be involved in the decision. Um, you know, the problem was she had read my first two manuscripts. And they were crap. <laughs> they were absolute crap. She knew they were crap. Thus, the secret. Oh. So what? <laughs> So I think what really made my my career happen, I mean, the reason I'm here talking to you is because I decided that I needed to write a book that I would enjoy, which is a thriller, mm-hmm. it would pull me through the pages, mm-hmm. but that my wife would respect, which is something with a little more of a literary quality. And that's a, that's a loaded word, I know. But for me, it means meaningful characters, deep yeah. backstory. Um, you know, some some thematic elements that you might not otherwise see. But most importantly for me, a real attention to language, because language matters. And you can do things with language beyond tell a story. You can create emotional resonance with language. You can make people stop and say, whoa, whoa, why am I feeling what I'm feeling? And I'm not saying I'm great at that, but that's what I aspire to do. And so the reason that The King of Lies worked and the reason that Downriver became a, a you know, a, a pick in London and England, all these things was because I was trying to write a book that I would enjoy and my wife would respect. That That's a long play by play, but there it is. Oh, no, that's that's that. 
that, that's interesting, uh, I mean, fascinating, really. But it, it also, if you don't mind, gives rise to a couple of questions. Were you reading many authors when you were writing The King of Lies, given that you were a new dad? So I mean, it's so fun to talk to you know other authors about this, because I'm going to throw this out as something that you might have an opinion on as well. Um, I found that if I read authors that I admire while I am writing, yep. I start to internalize and bastardize that voice and then put it into my own work. I apologize for that. That's my wife's pad. I don't even know how to turn that off. <laughs> um, but, but to your point, I, for, uh, here's, a, here's a specific, for instance, um, I love James Lee Burke. He's a you know Southern writer. He's 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 very lyrical. He does great stuff with language. I'd never heard of him before my first novel came out, and then I started getting reviews comparing me to James Lee Burke, and I was like, yeah. okay, well, I should probably read James Lee Burke. And at that time, he had a novel out called Pegasus Descending, mm -hmm. and I read it while I was writing King of Lies. I mean, uh, Down River, mm -hmm. second book after King of Lies. And my wife is sort of my she's my reader. You know, she she keeps me honest. And I gave her a, a block of pages, probably 30 pages, and she read them and she said, I don't I do not understand what's happening here. You have been doing you and here it's as if you vomited sugar water all over the pages. I mean, that those were her exact words. And what, what I realized <laughs> I those pages while I was reading Burke, you know, and Burke, it, Burke does Burke so well. But if you read Burke and you internalize <laughs> that, you you, you, uh, you f it up. You, you yeah. just you do. And so you know, I, I left what was working for me, and I and I screwed the whole pooch. Mm -hmm. um, so I learned early that it's really important to not read people that you enjoy while writing. Um, maybe it's because I'm a language major, but I internalize that stuff. It, uh, so okay. That that's not where I thought you were taking that. When you started to discuss how you would read authors whom you admired, I nodded so vigorously because for me, when I am writing, which is not often, I mean, I, I should write more, my agent tells me. Not because of, I'm so, all of us, all of us. Oh, <laughs> sorry. I, yeah, I heard it. That's, you know, <laughs> it, 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 thank you. Uh, I, I, I find it inspiring. I, I, I like to absorb it to an extent. But even as I say that, I recognize that with this latest book, I was reading a number of authors whom I really rate. And it was apparent in the text when I was basically ventriloquizing another author as opposed to writing as myself. Not that I am such a special little pony, but you do want to write. You can only write in your own voice. Mm -hmm. So, John, your first book is published. It is successful. It becomes the bestseller, as I recall. It actually attained. Uh, it did, did, yes, thank the good Lord. But yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> all, all, all the mystic gods of publishing. <laughs> did, did you continue to work then, or at what point did you say, you know what, I'm a writer full time? Oh, oh, I love this because, you know, th there's this great story about um, any writer that ends up doing this full time. How, how did it happen? I mean, yeah, we're yeah. all fascinated by this and I'm fascinated by this. So I've often said um, I take very little credit for whatever talent I have because I was born with it. I mean, sure. it was God given or genetics, whatever it is. I did spend a fair amount of time trying to hone it. Um the thing that I'm really proud of is the perseverance and the really hard decisions mm -hmm. that I've made in trying to become a full-time novelist. And, and, and I'll explain what I mean. Um, I wrote one novel and nobody gave a fig. I wrote a second novel and nobody gave a fig. I could tell that the learning curve was in the right direction. I was getting better. So, as I mentioned earlier, I was a young lawyer with a stay-at-home wife and a brand new kid, and, and I just accepted it as an article of faith that I could write something worthy. I mean, and I think that's so important, and it, it's so easily lost in the stories of how people become published and change their lives. I mean, it really starts with faith in oneself. I mean, this conviction that one can do it, that I can do it, that you can do it.
yep. she can do it. I mean, it, it's so important. Um, so I quit my law practice to take one more shot and the world is full of doubters. There, there are people that will tell you, don't waste your time. You'll never get published. And I think that these are people who have given up on their own dreams yeah. for whatever reason. And the last thing they want is to see AJ Finn succeed or to see John Hart succeed. Yes. Um, there, there was a, a surgeon in my um, very small town, 30,000 people. I grew up with his kids. I was in a coffee shop one morning. He'd heard what I was doing and he literally put his finger on my chest and said, who the hell do you think you are? Do you think you're the next John Grisham? And I was like, yeah, who the hell do you think you are? Why does he care? Yeah. yeah. Who the hell do you think you are? I mean, this, this is insane. Um, so after two failed novels, I decided I'm going to go for the brass ring. Mm -hmm. I quit my job. I, my wife was on board. We canceled cable. We stopped eating out. We lived lean. We had a brand new baby. And I knew that we were going to have other kids. So this is my shot. Because yes. if I don't do it now, I'm, I'm not going to be a good lawyer. I'm not going to be a good father. I'm definitely yeah. not going to be a good writer. I mean, this, this is the time to do it. This is the time right now to do it. And in spite of all these discouragers, and the world is full of them, and I was lucky to find a few uh, of the opposite stripe. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I spent a year in the local public library and, and wrote The King of Lies, um, as I said, a book that I would enjoy my wife would respect. Um, and I... I I'm going to be honest with you, man. I don't remember what your actual question was. I've just been holding forth now. No, no uh, I, nor do I. I, I was asking <laughs> lasers that cause wildfires. This is so interesting. Please continue. Uh, well, so so here's the thing. Um, oh, I, I think our, uh, I think I can at least go in the right direction without remembering specific questions. So um, I, I quit my law practice. I wrote The King of Lies. I gave myself 12 months and finished it in 11 and a half. Mm -hmm. uh, and I started sending it out and rookie writer mistake. I sent it out too soon before I'd really digested and, you know, edited and made it proper. And so a lot of agents rejected it and I got depressed and spent nine months and I never went back to the law. I became a stockbroker for Merrill Lynch in Greensboro, North Carolina. It was a great job. I love my people there, but I realized after six or seven months that I'd, I'd sold myself short. You know, I, I spent a year writing this. It was my third effort. I never really did it justice. Uh, and I spent three, four, five months editing it. And then, you know, I sent it out and everybody that saw it wanted to represent it for the most part. I mean, there were some rejections, but for the most part, but the, the point I'm trying to get to is this, I'm, I, and I'm going to paint a word picture for you. Please do. So, so I'm, um, I don't know, almost 40 at this point. I'm an old dude. And I'm sitting in my office <laughs> and it's got, it's got all the crap on the walls, you know, it's diplomas and art and family pictures. And I'm at Merrill Lynch in Greensboro and I get the call from my agent. It's what we all wait for. Yeah. Call from the agent saying, Hey man, you know, your life's about to change. So we've been rejected, rejected. And then the phone call comes and he's like, John, I have good news for you. Picture this. I'm um, phones to my ear, feet are on the desk. And in my mind's eye, all of that stuff on the walls, it's coming down and it's boxed up because I'm out of here. man. <laughs> I have a writer. Screw this. Right. And then he says, John, I have great news. And then he finishes the sentences. The sentence, um, you know, St. Martin's Press has offered seventy five hundred dollars for your first novel. And I'm like, oh, uh, no, <laughs> that's a year of my life. Seventy five hundred or seventy five thousand hundred for the king of lies. And, and I said to my agent, I said, man, that, that doesn't sound really great. And he said, well, let me see what I can do. So he, he calls my editor and asks for more. And my editor said this, and I, I love this, and I give him shit about it this day. He says, we all understand, you know, the power of a five-figure offer. <laughs> <laughs> I was I like, don't. okay, don't. all right, all right. So, um, but they were the only people that wanted to publish me. So um, I sold The King of Lies for a $7,500 advance. And as you know, you pay your agent, you pay Uncle Sam. I mean, the, the, it's not a year of your life. Yeah. Um, but the book came out of the gate and, and hit the times list. And the, the publisher said, you know, we really need to be in the John Hart business. Uh, and they made me an offer uh, for a couple more books. And I was able to quit my job and, and start doing this full time, which I've been doing ever since. But I'll tell you one thing. My my agent, he he died. This is kind of a really sad story. He was 50, a marathoner, never smoked, 
but he was downtown on 9-11 and he, he breathed in all that stuff and it killed him. Um, you know, years oh. later, lung cancer, really lovely man. Um, but he said something to me that I'll never forget when, when I was like 7,500 bucks, are you kidding me? He said, look, that's what Patricia Cornwell got. You know, it's more than Grisham got. It's more than Clancy got. It's, it's not about the entry ticket. That is it's true. about getting in the game that's and letting true. the market decide. And, and those were very wise words, uh, from a man that is no longer with us. And so, you know, he was right. And I took it because I was, you know, desperate to be published, um, and, and the book worked and the next books worked. And, and so here we are, but, um, I, I'm trying to figure out what the, what the moral of all this is, if there are any aspiring writers out there. And I, I really think it's just, if you don't have faith in yourself, nobody else will. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, keep the faith. Um, I said earlier, you know, whatever talent I have, I was born with and maybe I honed it through, uh, trial and error. But the one thing I'm really proud of, um, AJ is that, uh, Anytime there was a hard choice, mm -hmm. like I, I quit my law practice to write a book with no guarantee it would be published. Yep. When I was at Merrill Lynch, I was making more money than I'd ever dreamed of making in my life. I mean, I, I was really doing well at it. And I left that on a $7,500 advance because I knew that if I was going to play in this game against people that were writing full time, I had to be writing full time. So it was an act of utter faith. And, um, I, I don't know. I give my parents credit for raising me to take that chance um, and my wife for being willing to live with it. But it, it was it could have. I mean, I could have very easily said, man, it's it's too risky, you know, and I'm so glad I did not. So if I understand you correctly, John, and I'm, I'm trying to paraphrase you for the benefit of, of those amongst our listeners who are interested in pursuing writing careers of their own. You seem to be asserting and I agree that talent certainly matters and however that is assembled however that's concocted yeah you want as much as possible beyond that though all you can control is yourself how disciplined you are how much time you decide to devote to this particular pursuit and i hear my own nasal voice and my entitled tone and i recognize that i sound as though I'm, I'm damning people who are having a tough time riding as being insufficiently disciplined. I guarantee at least 60% of them are more disciplined than I am. And I don't say that flippantly. We're all, we're all screwed in our own way. I we mean, are. I mean, <laughs> you know, no, no writer is like got <laughs> into the perfect. We're all effed. I mean, come on. There's my tombstone right there. John, I really like that. Thank you. But you can control to a large extent how hard you work and the decisions that you make, professional, personal, et cetera. So well said, I mean, you said it better. I would like now to ask one inside baseball question before we get to the unwilling. The inside baseball question pertains to the Edgar Awards, which are awarded annually by the Mystery Writers of America to the best of the best in crime fiction. One of the reasons I've always liked the NWA awards is that they actually take pains to recognize a broad range of publications from TV episode scripts to young adult detective fiction. But of course, they do crown a best novel winner. And John, it's so funny. When I was nominated for the best novel, Edgar, do you know what I said? I said, fuck all, because I wasn't nominated, you smug SOB. You, <laughs> however, have, have, remind me, John, have you ever won? Uh, uh, once or twice. <laughs> 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 that was like 10% obnoxious and 90% 90, 90 really polite. I wasn't sure how to answer that. I mean, to be honest. I, I put you on the spot. You are the only writer in the decades and decades long history of that organization, which is old. They must be approaching 80, if not beyond. You are the only writer to have won that top gong twice. I will say, 
as a rule, I generally don't care about awards. And I'm not talking about awards for myself. If I win an award, I care very much. That's a, yeah, we all do. <laughs> how tasteful they are. But, you know, I'll think of the Oscars and I'll, I don't know. There's cronies in there. Here, not so much. You were assessed on your publication's merit by a team of nominators and voters who really know their stuff. And you win once. How did that feel? Okay, so so I'm, I'm going to correct the record for just a moment. A couple others have won it twice. Um, so, Jeff yeah. Parker won it twice. Dick Francis actually won it three times. Took him 32 years, but still three times. Um, I, I'm the only guy that won it for consecutive novels. So well, thank you. Um, yes, that's I won it in '08 for Downriver, and then in 2010 uh, for The Last Child. It, it's, it's funny, man. I, I'm I'm kind of with you with awards. I mean, who who knows who yeah. makes these decisions? But I've actually served on a judging panel for the Edgars. For I did it for best first novel. And I can tell you that, you know, people take it pretty seriously because yeah. we're all, the judges are all writers and, and they understand. I mean, they understand the way that writers do. I, I don't have to explain that to you. I mean, you, you know what I'm talking about. Um, I don't know if there's politics involved. Perhaps there is. I hope to God not. For me, um, it's so funny, man. Um, my original ambition in writing The King of Lies after two failed novels was I just want to get published. Sure. I don't care, man. I, I just want to have a book that's picked up by someone that's paying me for the privilege that believes in what I'm doing and is just going to put it out there. I don't care if I'm carrying around in the trunk of my car. I just want to be published. I don't want to pay for it myself. Right. I mean, you, you know, you're in the business. I mean, we writers are, are, are kind of a desperate crowd. I mean, we're we're badass in one way and utterly feeble in another. It's, it's really an, an interesting thing. <laughs> I mean, you're laughing. You know what I'm talking about. It's so true. It's, it's so, so true. true. It's so true. It's so freaking true. And people don't really understand that. Um, so that was my goal. Right. And, and I can prove it because the first novel that was picked up was set in my hometown. And I remember writing in my hometown because I knew it and I knew the bad guys and the bad streets and all these things. And I said to myself, this is a fool's errand. But if I ever get published, I'll just change the name. But I, I was so overwhelmed by being published, I completely forgot to do it. So the book was, you know, came out set in my hometown, um, and, and no one's forgiven me yet. I mean, it's just like, <laughs> you know, screw you, John Hart. Um, but, but it does matter. I mean, you know, the, these things matter. So uh, our, my first three novels, number one was nominated for Best uh, Edgar. I mean, Edgar Award for Best First Novel. And then the next two won the Edgar for the best novel, which is kind of amazing to me because I always wanted to, to achieve something unequivocal. Mm -hmm. And it's, it, how do you define that? I mean, is it marrying the perfect person or building the perfect house or, you know, hitting a hole in one? It depends on who you are. I mean, I'm not a golfer, so that's <laughs> these things. <laughs> but but how do you define something unequivocal? And you know, I I'd kind I mean, I've always felt that I did that with my marriage. My I love my wife, but professionally, how do you do something unequivocal? And I really thought that winning the Edgar Award was it, and then winning it twice. I mean, I'm still kind of dumbfounded by it. I I will be honest. I mean, I'm dumbfounded by the whole thing. And my my publisher, my dear sweet publisher. Um, who was there for the second one? Yeah, he died. But he he got yeah. He so was he there. Died. He was there, but he passed. And he got. He died on yeah. cancer not too long ago. Anyway, yeah, it's just it's a journey, right? I mean, the, the people that are yeah that are with you. That not not to uh, not to dwell. That must have made him so proud to uh -huh. see an author whom he uh, you know seventy five hundred. Not great. <laughs> it was great. Look, it was great. I, I get choked up for Matthew Shear. He was a hell of a guy. Oh, was it Matthew Shear? Yeah, it's Matthew Shear. Of course it was. Oh gosh. He was a I met him a couple of times. He was lovely. He was. And quite uh all right. Well, this is he like was bigger than he's bigger than life. He's larger than yes, life. He was. And anyway. So quick question. Which victory surprised you more? One or two? Oh, um, so it's kind of, it's, it's kind of funny. Um, so 
uh, I went for the best first novel uh-huh. and lost to Alex Berenson. Um, yes, the uh, Faithful Spy. The Faithful Spy. Yes. That's right, and well deserved. And he was so gracious. It was so funny. He got up on the stage and they handed him the. You remember? I remember. He broke the half. <laughs> I just want to thank you for these two Edgars. <laughs> it was really great. Um, so then I got a call from my editor uh, a year later, and he said, "Hey, you know, John, um, you know, the good news is uh, you've been uh, nominated for another Edgar. This is for best novel." I said, "The bad news is you're not going to win. You don't have a chance in hell." And I said, "Oh well, snap. You know why is that?" And he said, "Well, you know, it's a." Uh, you're up against Michael Chabon, who won the Pulitzer, and yeah. uh, John Banfield, who won the Booker Prize, and you know yeah. you're, you're just not going to win. So, but why don't you come up and we'll try to do it better than we did the last time? Because the first time, I mean, I stayed sober. <laughs> I didn't drink. Oh, no. I, had I know rookie mistake. Rookie mistake. <laughs> I had prepared remarks. I was ready to go. And he said, "Come on back up, and we'll we'll make up for all of your failures <laughs> last year." And I'll never forget it. Lee Child was the presenter uh, for the Best Novel Award. And every other presenter, as you know, I mean, there are a number of awards. Yes. And it's, you know, it's 12 or 1300 people. It's, you know, yes. three hours long. I mean, yes. people are, you know, those of us that are up, we're pretty into it. Everybody else is like, you know, what's, what's the time? <laughs> um, but I remember everybody that presented before the best novel, which is the final award, you know, they had the sense to take this little statue of Edgar Allan Poe. Mm-hmm. Uh, he, he was ugly in life. It's the ugliest statue. It's, ever it's the ugliest award in Christendom. I mean, it's, it's like willfully ugly. I swear yeah, they tried. It is. I mean, Edgar Allan Poe ran, rendered in alabaster in bright blue. is just not good, oh. but I wanted it, you know, I wanted it. <laughs> So uh, Lee Child gets up and uh, like everybody else, he puts the statue down on the podium facing out. So you could see the little plaque at the bottom. Well, I was only a table or two back and I'm, I'm looking at this and my wife's next to me. I'm, I don't have great vision, but I'm squinting really hard. <laughs> I'm the only person on the list of five with two short names. You know, it's John Banfield, Michael Shabon, they're big names. And I'm looking at her and I'm thinking, man, I, I kind of think that's me. And child, you know, Lee is doing this whole thing like, well, you know, I can't get the envelope open. I don't know who it is. And, and I, mean, I really think that I think that's a short name. Anyway, you know, um, I, I won and I was so flabbergasted. I'll never forget it. I got up on the stage um, and I was thinking as I walked up there, you know, don't forget to thank your wife because yeah. people make that mistake. And you get up there and the lights are so bright, you can't see anything. And, and i you know, I, I thank my wife and I thank my wife and I thank my wife again. And I thank my editor and my agent and everybody else. And the only thing I could see was like the front row of tables. And I remember being like halfway through it, like just bumbling along. And I looked down in the front table right there was Michael Connolly. And I, I'm like talking, talking. And I said, holy shit, that's Michael Connolly. <laughs> right in the middle of it. As you would. Sure. <laughs> not my finest moment. <laughs> <laughs> I really love that. Uh, okay, because I know time's a waste, and I want to I want to talk about this. So, it has seemed to me that since your second book and beginning with the Last Child, your fiction, which had which had kind of like seethed with psychological acuity, it it. It started to list more and more, and I say that approvingly, into psychological territory. We are no longer dwelling in courtrooms as, as much, not that we ever did, but you seem to be increasingly interested in taking your characters and your stories and your talent to, to new places and to making your talent work for a living. Was this a conscious decision? Would you agree with that? And is this a conscious decision on your part? Yeah, so I, I, I would totally agree with that. So keep in mind when I wrote The King of Lies, I mean, I was a struggling young attorney. Mm-hmm. I was trying to make a living in a small town. And you know, so I wrote what I knew, right, which was 
a young attorney who kind of hated his job and his life. He was in the law for all the wrong reasons. And that's the story that evolved. And right. you know, what I kind of figured out from that is that, um, you know, stories can evolve and they should evolve. And it, this conceit, and I know there are writers that, that outline and they have it all figured out in the, in the beginning before they write the first word of prose. That's not me. I mean, I, I need to live with the characters and the questions and the tensions and figure out whose story I'm telling. And it's, it's a grope and hope thing. Mm-hmm. Now, now maybe maybe you're an outliner, so no, no disrespect intended, because it really matters what works for you and, yes. and what works for me and everybody else. Um, so I, I wrote this novel, and I hated being a lawyer, man. I mean, I really hated it. I was a criminal attorney, and everybody was guilty, and they all smelled bad. And nobody wanted to pay me. It, it was just a crappy job um, that I thought was going to be better. Like, I went into it thinking there were going to be innocent people and yeah. – um, good causes and reasons to be excited. And it just turns out it's a slog of bad people that have done stupid things. And the King of Lies kind of reflects that. And it it informs a lot of my writing about crime and the ripples of crime. And, you know, there there are very few criminal masterminds out there. They do exist, but they're rare. Um, So that book came out and it did really well. And and I mentioned earlier, you know, everybody was saying, Oh, it's, you know, like John Grisham, it's like Scott Turow, it's a legal thriller. I mean, it's really flattering for a new guy, but, but that's a big damn shadow to willingly subscribe to for the rest of your career. So I, I made a conscious decision at that point to do something different, to, to do crime fiction, but not legal thrillers. Yes. And, and I will tell you honestly, and I, and I hope that this is the case with you as you uh, write more and more great novels. Um, it, it, no, sir, it, it's all about what interests you. I mean, what, what is compelling? Because if you do not have a passion, and I'm speaking more to the audience than you because I know you understand this, if a writer does not have a passion for the story and for the characters that people that story, the readers aren't going to give a flip. They're, yeah. they're not going to care. I mean, they even if, yeah, if they, they can be the most despicable people in the world, but if you do not love them, yes, the writer, if you do not love them enough to breathe life into them, the readers are not going to care at all. Mm-hmm. And I would say that's probably the most important piece of advice I would ever give to an aspiring um, writer of fiction is that, Man, if you don't love what you're doing, nobody else is going to love it. And I think there's so many people that think, well, here's the skill set. Here's the trick. Here's the trope. Uh, I'm just going to do what others have done and it's going to be fine. But that's bullshit because you've got to love the people that you write and you've got to wake up eager to spend time with them. And so as my books became different, as you very rightly uh, remark upon, it's only because I become fascinated with different characters and different questions and tensions and all these things. And so it's always a question of what kind of story does one want to tell? And, um, you know, it's, it's not clean or crisp. It's a muddled, muddy mess. Um, but we find our way through it. Again, having, having worked in, in publishing for 10 years, I had the opportunity to witness up close and personal, the evolution and extinction of a lot of trends. One trend that I I can no longer classify as a trend because it's proven so enduring, it's not just a vogue, but one trend at the time that I, I noticed, the world noticed, was the proliferation of psychological thrillers in the wake of Gillian Flynn's Gone Girl. Psychological thrillers had been published for decades. Patricia Highsmith, Ruth Rendell, the list goes on. The best, in my view, are usually written by women. But within a few years of Gone Girl, quite a lot of psychological thrillers were plainly being written to order. Now, I don't judge an author for making a cash grab. We all gotta eat, that's fine. That said, I do feel readers can tell and one of the aspects of your, see if I say metamorphosis, that sounds pretentious and I call you an insect, but let's I'm gonna give it to you, man. It's, uh, thank, it's, you. Get, thank you, thank you. Roll with it. That particularly interests me is how organic it has felt. I remember when I saw the title, The Last Child, I thought that does not sound at all legal. And then I saw that frankly gorgeous cover with the kid on the bike in silhouette against a sort of 
was it sundown or sunrise? It was beautiful either it was, way. It was nicely done. And I thought this must be a different kind of book. I read it and not once did it seem inorganic. It did not seem forced. So to my mind, you have been really successful in taking your imagination into well, new geographies, darker places. Your books are very frequently about the relationships, the intense relationships between men, brothers, friends, any sort of pairing. I should stress these are not these are not erotic relationships. These are not sexual relationships. They are charged. They are often intellectual boxing matches. And there's a physicality to them, sometimes literal, sometimes not. Do you do you have uh, how many how many brothers do you have? Man, I I, I love your questions. I mean, I love the way, I love the way you think this through because um, <laughs> you're making me think things through. You know, it's it's funny, man. Um, I have uh, a father that I love, although you know he divorced my mother and he's distant. And I have some stepbrothers uh, that I love, but we don't know each other or spend time with each other as, as adults as I would hope. Mm -hmm. Um, but, but there is, and always has been in me this, um, you know, powerful longing for a brother, yeah. you know, like, like someone that, you know, from the womb on gets it and has had these same experiences and that is just bankable no yeah. matter what. Um, and, and I've had friends like that and, and I've lost friends like that. And I think that it's so important to, um, you know, what we become as adults to really appreciate those things that we had and may have lost or those things that we wanted but never had. Um, and, and so they do inform the stuff that I write. And you, you talk about it feeling organic. You know, I, I never really set out to explore a theme or, uh, you know, whatever's hot in publishing, whatever the big no, thing no. is. It, it's just, I, I, I try to find a character that is compelling and then create a life that feels real to me and spin them through the motions of a really difficult plot. And because I start with character mm -hmm. and, um, you know, and, and life is hard and people suffer and people overcome. And it, it's really important this idea of having those that are with you on the journey and that have your back at all times. Um, you know, I, I have sisters that, that are there and, mm -hmm. you know, all the time. Um, but I don't write women as comfortably as I write men. It's not that um, I have less respect for them. I mean, this is you know, 21st century, but <laughs> and, and daughters, but, but I don't, I don't understand them. Right. I mean, the way I understand, I understand sons and fathers and sons and brothers and young men and their best friends. And that's really important stuff. And if you do it well, I honestly believe that the women readers will come to it also because it's true. It, it's, it's the human experience and it's true and we can all relate. Um, so I really I mean, it sound, I don't want to sound pretentious ever. Um, but but that's what I find fascinating about fiction is the opportunity to really get into the nitty gritty bits of what matters to people. I was listening to one of your many interviews of recent days, and I listened to about five of them, I think. And I was I was really pleased as a as a as some as a, as a wordsmith to hear you repeatedly say an historical fiction. Thank you for that. I, <laughs> your service was not in vain, sir. Oh, well, that, that was purely <laughs> accidental, I suspect. <laughs> but, <laughs> but The Unwilling is an historical fiction. You're first. Yes. This novel is set uh, at, well, in this novel, a young man welcomes his surviving brother back from Vietnam. And the surviving brother is is not thriving. I think it can be said. Fair. And as we read this story, and I'm going to spoil nothing. I, I'm not even going to touch on the recap, the, the, the very good recap on the flap. Mm -hmm. But as these brothers explore with some discomfort their reunion, the story takes them Oh boy, I'm going to tiptoe around this. The story takes them to a particular, an intersection, if you will, where something 
deeply stupid happens. And I don't mean stupid on your end. I, I mean, no, I, I got you. Just, yeah. Why would you do that? But, but everyone would do that, or many people. And very rapidly, very rapidly, events escalate. And what seemed initially to be a story of very wounded and tensile fraternal love is revealed to be merely one strand in a story that is actually about, in its, in its oblique way, the horrors of war. And I think you very wisely don't attempt to make this a war novel. Not that it can't be done, not that you couldn't do it, but a lot of readers don't want to go there. I, I, I wouldn't, to be honest. I would if you wrote it. But this is not a war novel. This is a thriller. It is a psychological drama. And above all, it is the story of two young men who are like magnets trying to connect, except they keep sort of skidding apart. Mm -hmm. Why did you decide to time travel back to the past? So, um, I mean, it, it's such an interesting thing, right? Um, I, I set challenges for every book I write that most people might not understand. Um, you know, The Hush was the first novel I've ever attempted with some magical realist um, realism elements. Redemption Road was the first female protagonist I've ever tried to write. Yes. The Last Child, which is still my favorite, you know, That's my was, favorite too. Yes, I love that book. Yes, was you know trying to create an adult themed thriller around a couple of thirteen year old boys and and not turn it into YA. I mean, you know, they, they, I always try to find something that that makes me excited to try to do that I've never conceived of doing before. And so, The Unwilling began as this conceit, this idea that I would write something set entirely in the past. I've never done that before. Mm -hmm. I, I love this term historical novel. I mean, because for me, it's just life. I mean, I was alive in 1972. I was seven years <laughs> old. Fair enough. I, I was far too young to, to go to Vietnam, but I remember the older kids that were terrified of the draft and those that were gung-ho to go and kill the gooks and the commies. And, you know, I mean, I heard these things. I mean, it was very real. It was visceral. It was in the streets. It was on the, you know, on the neighborhood block. I mean, there were kids that were eager to do these things or terrified of doing these things. Um, but, it, you know, it's, for me, it was, it was, it was not about the war. The war was just this really powerful backdrop to this childhood that I remembered. And, and I apologize if you've heard me say this in a previous interview. I've said this a few times, um, but, but it, it really is important to sort of how this story came to be um, because it really is a story of um, a soldier that comes home after three tours, most of them honorably, if not you know, embarrassingly well served, mm -hmm. but, uh, you know, under a cloud and addicted to drugs at the end of it. And um, his younger brother, who's about to graduate from high school and trying to determine what sort of man he wants to become. So the younger brother has been overly sheltered. I mean, he's been so protected by his terrified parents that are afraid he'll go to war. He'll become like his older brothers, one of whom died and one of whom came back so fundamentally changed. I think about 1972 this way. I, I don't know how old you are. Right? In 1972, I was seven. Mm -hmm. And life was simple. I mean, it was super simple at the time. I mean, we played in the creeks and we played in the woods and we played ball and we, did all, we didn't have smartphones or iPads or all of these things. Um, I don't know if you hear this. It's my wife's tablet pinging. No. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bury no, it. Hang on one second. Okay, I'm just going to bury it. You can probably hear my dog snoring. So, and, well, I'm, so I'll put your dog under the pillow with my wife's bed. <laughs> um, and we'll, we'll let him fight it out. Um, so, so my recollection of the early seventies was this simplicity, right? I mean, mm -hmm. but I was too young to understand what was going on. But I look back at that time now, and I understand how tumultuous it really was. I mean, we had racial strife then like we have now. I mean, there were race riots in Wilmington, North Carolina, right down the road where I spent my childhood summers. Um, you know, we had the Cold War, we had Vietnam, we had uh, corruption, inflation, Watergate, 
you know, we weren't that far from the Kent State shootings. You know, th th this country was really pulled apart in, in the early 70s in a way that's not dissimilar to where we are now. So I really like this idea of finding a way to tell a story about the simplicity that I remembered, and I'm holding up a hand here, and then the reality of what uh, the country was. And so for me, what that turned into is the younger son, Gibby, who's lived in this bubble, overly protected by his parents, horrified by the war and what the cost has been for them and their older sons. He's that innocence. And then the one surviving older brother who did three tours and was, you know, lauded as just, you know, a God awful soldier, like unbelievably effective, dangerous, and yet came home under this cloud and addicted to drugs. He, he kind of represents this more you know, dangerous geopolitic reality that, that was the seventies. And so I really wanted to try to find a way to tell a story that, that brought both of those things together. I, I'm not a thematic writer. I, I don't generally strive for that. I mean, I just want to tell a good story, but that was such a powerful memory for me, uh, what it was like to live without cell phones and all these things. And I mean, show me a kid now that plays in the Creek and, and I'll give you a thousand bucks. I mean, yeah. it's, it's crazy. Um, so I don't know. I just, I wanted to do that. And Vietnam is the war was such a great backdrop, just brooding, hovering over everything. And, um, and it's perfect for, you know, family dynamics and ripped apart communities and all of these things that make for good storytelling. As a, as a former editor and publisher, I find it frankly remarkable that your career achieved altitude so quickly and has continued to climb despite the fact that you are not writing a series, despite the fact that you are not writing the same book time and time again, despite the fact that you are actually, as we said, mixing your genres. I credit that, not that you ask, but I'm going to tell you to what I credit it. I credit that to two factors. The first is that, that blending of genres of which I spoke. And the second, I mean, I'm tempted to include character here. The characters sort of speak for themselves. They're indelible. I just accept them. The, the second aspect of your career, that uh, of your writing rather, that has, I think, put you in very good stead is that your books feel to me, and I hate this word, and, and you, you pointed out earlier how much you don't like this word, they feel literary, they feel substantive, they feel dense, they feel psychological, because they are. And I am not super literary at all. I, I mean, I, I happen to genuinely like Nabokov, I really do. I, I can't I can't read Faulkner. I just, we don't speak the same language. I'm all right with that. <laughs> when I read a John Hart book, I admit, I feel kind of smug because I can enjoy it on a, on a, on a, not superficial, but a surface level, surface level. You know, your stories are really, really entertaining. I mean, they just like at a base level, I need to know what happens. I, 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 I as I said earlier, I can't stop. But you can also experience them, and I do. You just surrender to them on this level as literature, really, as, as rewarding, sticky, resonant literature. And so in case St. Martin's asked, that is what a former publisher <laughs> observed. Hey, man, from your lips to God's ears. And, and <laughs> it, it's funny, right? I mean, we, we never really know how these stories are going to turn out. I mean, you know, we, we go into it with the best of intent, right? And, yeah. you know, we, we try to deliver what we can, but it's fraught with peril and fear yes. and uncertainty, right? I mean, it's, it's there's so much blood, sweat, and soul that goes into these pages, and there's no one that can look over your shoulder and say you're doing it right. Are you doing it wrong? I mean, it's oh, a year-long sustained leap of faith, but sometimes it's a two-year-long sustained leap of faith. And, you know, it, it works or it doesn't. You know, people love it or they don't. Um, you know, the, the reality is we, the books need to sell, right? So That is the reality. Yes. It, it is the reality. And so I don't ever want to be the guy that is going to 
sacrifice what I what I believe in and what I'm trying to do to like hit that bell to 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 find whatever track leads to to commercial success. I, I'll quit and walk away before I do that. I mean, I really will. I, I'll go. I, I live on a farm. I'll plant some corn, and and <laughs> that's fine. I mean, I, I love what I do, but it's it's not. Um, it's so sometimes difficult to jibe the reality of the creation part of this with the business part of publishing. And I've generally uh, like molded myself to that. Like I've, I've given what needs to be given. Yes. Um, I, I recognize the business. I understand the business and, and I've given whatever I could to, to make it work. But, you know, I, I think there's going to come a time where, um, I have to ask myself if it's worth it. I mean, if, if sure, yeah. you know, if it's worth it, I mean, I, I love the story, you know, I don't love the business. I do the business, but, but I love the story. Oh, Hey, hey. so hey, sorry. Sir. I'm sorry to cut in. You guys have been fascinating. I do want to get to, we we're almost out of time. I wanted to get to a couple of crowd questions. Oh, before I'm sorry. I didn't we... realize. I, I'm sorry. No, it's, it's it's not a problem at all. Like I said, I just want to I want to get to a couple of quick crowd questions before we tune out for the evening. So, um, John, we had one question that wanted to know: since the book was postponed, were you tempted to go back and do any more edits or anything, or did you just leave it alone between last summer and when it came out? I'm going to make that an affirmative hell no. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, yeah. man, you know. I live with this thing day in and day out. It took me 16 months to write it. I don't know how long to do edits and copy edits. When that baby is cooked, it is in the pan and out of my life. I yeah. mean, I, I love it. it. It kills me even now to see like um, Spielberg tweaking the Star Wars movies that I grew up with. I just want to punch the guy. <laughs> and, you know, embrace what you've created and live with it. So that's my attitude. And so I think you might have answered this um, when you when you guys were chatting. But do you have a favorite of your own books, John? Uh, it's always been The Last Child for me, but but I love different books for different reasons. I mean, King of Lies got me launched. Down River won the first Edgar. Uh, the Last Child was very personal about my childhood. I mean, I really had to dig deep to write that character. Um, the Unwilling is pretty high on that list. Um, I'll tell you honestly. But you know, I'm seven books in now, so it gets harder and harder. And I will say to one of the comments that you guys were talking about earlier about how last spring was so hard for books, you know, as booksellers, we're all really anxiously waiting for the stuff that came out, like as the pandemic was hitting in hardcover to start coming out in paperback now that we can actually have customers in the store and we can actually give those books kind of the fair shake that they weren't able to get when kind of people just couldn't get to them. Um, uh, Jill, sorry, uh, uh, if I can ask just a quick question about, about that sure. process, bookselling. Given that so many books had, to be postponed. I imagine there's been kind of a landslide, like certain release dates are much more crowded than they otherwise would have been. Does that represent an opportunity for you? Is it a challenge? So it was a little bit, uh, so a lot of stuff was postponed kind of early on and then kind of once, like I guess probably most stuff was moved into June or July because I think everybody had kind of assumed at that point by summer, like things would start to, to write themselves. So a lot of the spring stuff was pushed to kind of the summer and then kind of early fall. I think uh, John's book is probably one of the later pushes that we saw. Most things were just kind of moved just a couple of months. So it wasn't kind of too drastic for pub dates. Okay, thank you. Yeah, sure. Um, so I have a question from Sarah for both of you. Uh, let's start with AJ on this one. What's the last book that you read that blew you away? Uh, two two books. I, I uh, Very stupidly, I don't recommend this. I often read two books at the same time, which is just, which is just dumb. But two books, which I was reading at the same time. The first was... <laughs> The Shadow of the Wind by Carlos Ruiz Zafón, mm -hmm. which is this lush, bibliophiliac, historical mystery set in post-war Spain. Uh, Zafón wrote three more books in this trilogy before dying, quite sadly, at age 55, I think, last year. But The Shadow of the Wind is also notable for, I probably got this wrong, but I believe it is the most, it is the best-selling book ever originally written in Spanish after Don Quixote. So wow. that's not too shabby. And the <laughs> other is 
a novel that I didn't even realize existed. I had seen the movie from the early 80s starring Chevy Chase. It's called Fletch. And I read the novel by Gregory MacDonald. And it's, it's superb. It's all dialogue, basically. So it reads like a, a script. And it's snarky. I, I'm not snarky. I don't like snark. But this is just funny and obnoxious. <laughs> and yeah, I recommend. Uh, and how about you, John? What have you read? Oh, no, I don't read. Come on, writers. <laughs> <laughs> He's illiterate, folks. I mean, uh, you know, uh, I'm not sure how to read. <laughs> Um, let's see. So uh, Jake also asked for both of you, um, are you at all interested in incorporating the pandemic into anything future future that you're writing, or do you think you're going to avoid it? I'm going to start with a hell no. I will second that. Yes. <laughs> I mean, no, look, nobody wants to read about this. I mean, the, the whole uh, contagion type stuff was great before it actually ruined all of our lives. So no, I'm, I, I will never do that. I will say, was it Jake who asked this? So mm -hmm. that's a, yeah. that is a, I think it's a really good question, actually. My first and last novel was set almost entirely in the home of a woman who, for psychological reasons, could not venture outside. And conven conveniently, COVID happened. So the film version of my novel has been postponed a couple of times, in part because Disney bought Fox and in part because the movie Joker opened, it, it doesn't matter. It was filmed in 1985 is the point. And it's <laughs> going to be released on Netflix, which I'm very, very pleased about in June. And I, I'm sort of curious as to whether they're going to work that angle, that housebound paranoia into their marketing. If they're going to come up with a line like, that stuck inside, so is she. Maybe that'll be viewed as crass and exploitative, but the fact is, that situation mirrors our own. But hey, I, I, I'm sorry, go on. No, I was, have you seen the the cut? I mean, have you have you seen the the film? Well, John, the movie was made in 2018, and here we are in 2021. So, oh, I didn't, I didn't I, realize I, I have not, right, I have so not, that was a wind up. I have not seen it, and <laughs> yeah, I know. At this point, I, 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 I try to be polite. I'm a little impatient, but the folks at Netflix have been terrific. And I know the set is gorgeous. The director and the leading lady in particular are remarkable. I cannot wait to see it. Me either. I'm, I'm excited. Thank you, sir. I appreciate that. Absolutely. Awesome. Well, thank you, gentlemen, both uh, for joining us this evening. So to wrap up, if you guys have uh, tuned in late, we have been chatting with John Hart, whose newest book, The Unwilling, just came out Tuesday. Uh, we have signed book plates for it, so you can order those at murderbooks.com. We've dropped links to um, that to order in the comments. And we've also been chatting with AJ Finn, whose book, The Woman in the Window, is available in paperback now, which we also have copies in store. Like I said, you can order both of those online. If you missed any part of the chat and you want to watch it again, uh, once we are done this evening. Uh, Facebook and YouTube will archive it, so it'll be available. I think YouTube takes just a little bit longer to get it formatted, but you'll be able to rewatch there. And also, while you're on the YouTube channel, make sure that you check out all of the other great uh, author chats that we've had, um, and also see what we've got coming up. Uh, AJ, thank you so much for taking the time this evening to chat with John. It was really great to actually get to meet you in person, or virtually this way, and we appreciate it. Um, and John, it was so good to see you. I'm so sorry we were not able to do this in the store, but like you said, hopefully for the next one, we'll be able to get you next back time. and do it normal again next time aj you've been awesome man i really appreciate it thank you oh john you've been like a c minus <laughs> <laughs> yeah well as long as you're happy this is no you, um thank you I, again i don't mean to embarrass you but as i said you were one of the three authors at whose careers i looked and thought wow i mean i uh, please so i'm i'm so excited about this the book the book is a triumph so congratulations Thank you. Thank you, man. I appreciate it. Seriously. Of John, course. Have a good evening. Give my best. Y'all take, take care. We'll do. John, Thanks. thank you so much. Sure. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you.